A reading from Ephesians. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his power. Put on the whole armor of God so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For our struggle is not against the enemies of blood and flesh, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers of this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God, so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day, and having done everything, to stand firm. Stand, therefore, and fasten the belt of truth around your waist. Put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. Pray in the Spirit at all times, in every prayer and supplication. To that end, keep alert, and always persevere in supplication for all the saints. Pray also for me, so that when I speak, a message may be given to me to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel, for which I am an ambassador in chains. Pray that I may declare it boldly, as I must speak. This is the word of the Lord. Please stand for the reading of the gospel. <clears throat> the Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Matthew. Lord, then Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane, and he said to his disciples, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, and began to be grieved and agitated. Then he said to them, I am deeply grieved, even to death. Remain here and stay awake with me. And going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Yet not what I want, but what you want. Then he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, So could you not stay awake with me one hour? Stay awake and pray that you may not come into the time of trial. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Again, he went away for a second time and prayed. My father, if this cannot pass until I drink it, your will be done. Again, he came and found them sleeping, for their eyes were heavy. So leaving them again, he went away and prayed for the third time, saying the same words. Then he came to the disciples and said to them, Are you still sleeping and taking your rest? See, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is betrayed into the hands of sinners. Get up, let us be going. See, my betrayer is at hand. The Gospel of the Lord. Please bow with me in prayer. Lord, take my lips and speak through them. Take our minds and think through them. Take our hearts and set them on fire with love for your Son, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Well, we are continuing on our fall sermon series on the fruit of the Spirit. And for those of you that may not have been here or are visiting, we're in the final fruit in Galatians chapter 5. And if I brought the kids up here, they could name all the fruit. You know that, right? Because they learned the song. And I'm wondering how many of you could do that if we started marching through them. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. You got that, right? Okay, repeat it. No, just kidding. 
But the reality is, as much as this is the last in the series in Galatians chapter 5, it's not the final fruit of the Spirit that we're going to be talking about. So stay tuned for next week. And if you're not here, stream it. But the reality is that we're going to talk about the last of the fruit in Galatians chapter 5 that in fact is described as the character of Jesus. You know that if you were to summarize all of those fruit, it would describe the character, the person of Jesus and who he was in his person as he carried out his ministry. And I find that it begins with love. It has to. Love of the Lord and love of each other. But then it continues throughout the rest. And probably one of the more challenging ones is self-control. Now, I want you to think back to when you were a child just for a second because when you were a child, you probably heard the words, control yourself. I know I did. You know, sometimes with anger, sometimes with crying or tears, sometimes with fear, whatever it is that creeps in, you know, maybe because you're hurt, maybe because you had a nightmare or there's a thunderstorm, whatever it is that creeps in. And my parents would say, control yourself. And, and one of the things that would often, you know, come to mind as an answer is, I can't help it. Right? I can't help it. That's true. Because we don't have the soundness within our person yet. The growth, the maturity. And maybe back in those days, not even the Holy Spirit in operation in my life. So when I said, I can't help it, that was true. But as we grow and mature, supposedly, we develop self-control. But that's not always the case. Sometimes it's not possible as a child, it's still not possible as an adult, or sometimes we would even say it's impossible for me to control myself because of what's going on. And sometimes we say it because look at what's going on here, or sometimes look at them, they need to control themselves, or it really is I can't control myself, whatever it is. And when we say I can't help it, what are we basically saying? It's who I am. It's who I am. That's just the way I am. Or we blame it on that's what I feel. And so much in our country today when it comes to how people respond and how people do things, it's all about how they feel. Because they follow their feelings. And so when they say they can't control them, themselves, they may say, you know, it's just the way I am. This is what I'm feeling. This is therefore how I'm going to act. And in fact, that's a denial of what we see with the Lord. And it's a denial of reality that we can't control ourselves. Do you remember, for some of you, I mean, some of you, this may go back too far, Flip Wilson? Remember what Flip Wilson used to say? The devil made me do it. Now, wait a second. The devil doesn't make you do anything. The devil may tempt you, but he doesn't make you do anything. It's like when my kids used to get mad and they used to say to me, Dad, you make me so mad. And I would look at them and I'd say, I can't make you anything. I said, because if I can't make you love me, if I can't make you willfully do what I ask you to do, what makes you think I can make you angry. That's your choice. And they used to get even angrier. <laughs> but it's true. It's really true. No one can make you ang angry. Angry is a response. And then part of it is what you do with that anger in terms of you're going to follow the Lord or you're going to do something that's kind of destructive or bad. But the point is, is that no one can make you do anything. You know, very similar to that, you would find on Saturday Night Live, the church lady who would describe something going on, then all of a sudden would say, Satan! It's not Satan. I mean, Satan may be, you know, drawing the temptation, causing an issue or a challenge or something like that, but it's not Satan that does it. It's us. Because we choose to follow whatever it is that we're dealing with. And how we choose to respond is based on sometimes our emotions, sometimes what's in our mind, sometimes what's in our spirit. 
Or do we want to blame our bodies? You know, the reality is we are one person. If you look at what Jesus said with love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, we have four dimensions to who we are, but we are one person that has these different dimensions and temptation or trial or challenge can come to any of those dimensions and then we have a decision to make as to how we're going to respond to those dimensions. And the question is, what or who controls it? See, because in many ways it is a spiritual battle underlying it all. And that's why if you heard Ephesians 6, the whole armor of God, that we are not dealing with flesh and blood alone. That's basically what Paul's saying. We're dealing with principalities, powers, this present darkness, the spiritual forces in the universe. That may be the source of the temptation or the trial or even the challenges that are going on around us. That needn't control us. That needn't determine how we respond. Let's look at the gospel just momentarily. The gospel, you see, on the one hand, Jesus Jesus is in this battleground. You have to remember he's fully human and he's fully God. But he has to wrestle with the human side that he that he's, has as a whole of his person. You know, just like the temptations that when he had at the beginning of his ministry, here's another temptation. And as he's wrestling with this, you know, Father, I really don't want to go through this. This is not going to be fun or pleasant, what I'm about to face. But what does he say? Not my will, but your will be done. Now hold that thought. Then you've got the apostles. And even the inner three. You've got Peter, James, and John. And Jesus takes them aside and says, pray with me. (laughs) They fall asleep. Good commitment. Those are my buddies. And then comes by and wakes him up and says, can you not pray with me? Then he goes back to pray again. Not my will, your will be done. Comes back, they're sleeping again. They have no strength, no resolve. Because they're not seeking the Holy Spirit to help them in the midst of their prayer, in the midst of their struggle, in the midst of their fatigue. Which they could blame it on. You know, Lord, it was a long day. I'm just really tired. Okay. You think Jesus wasn't? See, we can always find blame. We can blame other people. We can blame the world. We can blame Satan. We can even blame part of who we are. But it comes down to, is it this self, myself, or is it the Holy Spirit that's going to control me? That my self-control doesn't come out of my ability to control. It comes out of the power of the Holy Spirit working in us because we have asked Jesus to be our Savior and our Lord. That's the question. See, because oftentimes if we rely on this self, my mind, my heart, my spirit, even my body apart from him, I can't do it. I need him. Even when it comes to the most basic things about life and faith. To worship, to pray, to spend time in his word. Because going back to Satan for a minute, he doesn't want you doing that. And so you acquiesce. I'm a little tired, you know, I'd like to sleep in whether it be Sunday or whether it be during the week, instead of getting up and spending a little time with the Lord. Or our feelings aren't in it that day. Or my mind is tired. I mean, any excuse may be a good excuse for this world. But when it comes to the Lord, He says to us, I am sufficient. I'm sufficient. And I sent my Holy Spirit so that you can. You know, the nature of a disciple is that the disciple follows the one that is the leader. A disciple is one who learns. The word disciple means learner, 
follower. And the question is, who or what are we going to follow and why? See, because ourselves, our flesh, this body apart from him, apart from the Holy Spirit working in us, we will do what we want to do. We will do what we feel. We will do whatever it is we want to blame things on in our lives instead of emptying ourselves of ourselves, which we read in Philippians 2. I've referred to that several times through this series. That if we want to be filled with the Holy Spirit and bear the fruit of the Spirit, we have to empty ourselves instead of indulging ourselves. Just like Adam and Eve blame something, someone else. We can always do that. Instead of saying, this is the Lord's call on my life. This is what his word says. This is who I seek to follow. And so I choose to empty myself and be filled with the Holy Spirit so that his power is working in us. Not our own ability, his power. You know, sometimes we make the mistake, much like the Pharisees and Sadducees did, thinking that it's all about my ability to buck up. Because the Pharisees and Sadducees, they sought to fulfill the law. But guess what? Many times it was also of their own flesh, of their own ability, of their own self-will that they would do it. And they would structure the laws that would be convenient for them, easy for them, so that they could work it out and justify or rationalize. We can do that too. We can be legalistic in our lives apart from him. We can follow the law, but that doesn't mean we're following the Lord because we don't really seek to love him. We want to do what we want to do, and it happens to be we want to be good people, by the law, legalistic. It's not what God wants. God wants us to follow him. God wants us to follow his will, but not out of legalism. That's the problem. And if you go to John 8 in particular, and I invite you to do this later, the scriptures are in your bulletin in the outline. But in John chapter 8, where Jesus is dialoguing, with the Pharisees and Sadducees, the religious leaders. And he says, God's not your father because you're really not walking with him, because you're really not seeking him. It's Satan. And it's like you could have hit them with a two by four because they missed the point. That when the Old Testament summarizes the law in Deuteronomy, it's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's where the Ten Commandments come out of. And then love your neighbor as yourself. It comes out of that strength, that love. It comes from a sound mind, which means the whole of you holds together. Your mind is also the seat of the will. Willfully, you're saying, I want to follow the Lord. I want to do what he's calling me to do. But we can willfully say, you know what, this is really kind of who I am, Lord. You know, you've really got to understand that. And so you'll accommodate me, right? Wink, wink. When if we're wholly and completely dedicated to him in love, we seek his wisdom. If we seek his wisdom, that's practically applying the word of God, which means we're seeking him and his will through the word. And then in prayer, we're seeking the power of the Holy Spirit to transform us. So the bottom line is, are we operating in our own power, in our own strength, with our own mind and willfulness, or are we operating with the power of the Holy Spirit? That's really the question. Because if we're not every day emptying ourselves, every day seeking him, every day seeking his Holy Spirit to transform us, if in the moment we're struggling with something, circumstances, other people that are out of control, can we maintain because of the Holy Spirit working in us? And a lot of times what we end up doing is we end up wanting to be the God of our own lives. That we dictate how it is. We dictate what goodness is. We dictate what holiness is. We dictate the way it should be in other people or ourselves. And it goes back to Adam and Eve, frankly. Because they had the choice and the serpent came along and said, you know, If you eat this fruit, you'll be just like God. You'll be the God of your own life. Oh, that's what I really want. And so they disobeyed. And so they walked away. You know, it's fascinating. During the time 
of the Old Testament with Moses and during the time in the New Testament with Jesus and the Caesars, you had Pharaoh, you had Caesars and some of the kings. And what were they during their time? Number one, worldly wise, they were the power. They were the ones who had the power. And what happened in time also, Pharaohs and kings and Caesars would become the law. Whatever they said, whatever they did, it was okay because they were the law. And then eventually it would even go to the point of they were God, small g. You know, in an overt way, in the pinnacle of humanity way, that's what we, in our smaller way, want to do. We want to be the little g God of our life. And then it becomes all about ourselves instead of all about the Lord. And that's where the problems come in. That's when it's really not understanding self and controlling oneself as opposed to the Holy Spirit filling us, changing us, and operate in self-control by the Holy Spirit. So who's really the one sitting on the throne in your life? Who's really the one making the decisions? When we talk about self-control in the scriptures, in this context, it is the fruit of the Spirit, not the fruit of me, the fruit of the Holy Spirit working in us. That's the difference. That's how we begin to take on the character of Jesus. When we realize any fruit that comes from us needs to be by the power of the Holy Spirit working in us. You know, one of the scriptures that comes to mind when I start thinking about, you know, this kind of wrestling that we do in our lives comes from uh, Romans chapter 7, where Paul is writing the tongue-twisting chapter 7. I do not understand my own actions, for I do not know what I want, but I do the very thing that I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, I agree that the law is good, but in fact, it is no longer I that do it, but sin. For I know that nothing good dwells within me, and it's my flesh. And I want to do what's right, but I cannot do it. For I do not the good that I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Take a minute and think about that, but not now, okay? You know, the bottom line is that it's not dualism. It's not these two personalities clashing. It's not good versus evil. What it is is, who am I following and why? Who am I following and why? Who am I listening to? Am I listening to my inner self or am I listening to God in Jesus Christ who dwells in me and the power of the Holy Spirit working through me? You know, another way to put it, some of you have probably heard this proverb, the Proverbs of the two dogs, that everybody has two dogs inside them and they're fighting and the one that you feed is the one that will win. You ever heard that? It's a great image. See, and how do we feed our relationship with the Lord? We feed our relationship with the Lord through turning to Him every day and emptying ourselves and filling ourselves with His Word and with the Holy Spirit. We feed by seeking to worship Him. We feed when we're in the midst of challenges, not relying on our own abilities, but on His power. We feed when we're desperate because we fear or we're angry or we're struggling. We say, Lord, I can't do this, but you can. Because we want our master to win. We want him to master us. You know, Paul uses the image of an athlete and a soldier. And what he talks about is, at times, this is 1 Corinthians, he talks about how we need to practice restraint if we're going to win the prize. He talks about also how we need to be disciplined. But again, even the discipline, the ability to do what he calls us to do, requires his strength because we will fail. We need a trainer to teach us. We need a master to help us. And the way that John, the apostle, would talk about it is when he refers to himself as the beloved apostle. Because he knew he was loved, 
He was able to seek to follow the Lord. He was the one that would go to the cross. He was the one that would run to the tomb. He was the one that was beloved of Jesus because he knew it. He knew it. See, once you realize that Jesus died for your sin, and you know him, and you trust his love, once you begin to seek him out as your Lord, and you allow him to take your life, to fill you with his Holy Spirit and change you, then you will be able to operate with self-control because it's a fruit of the Spirit. Just as the list of the fruit of the Spirit begins with love, so it ends with self-control. And that's how we grow in the character of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord God, sometimes we do have this wrestling match going on within us. A wrestling match that we want to be the Lord of our lives. And yet at the same time, you call us, you ask us to empty ourselves and be filled with your spirit, that you would truly be Lord as well as Savior. Lord, help us to see the reality of the cross, what you did for us, for our sake. How you denied yourself and you took up the cross and you invite us to do the same and follow you as our Savior, as our Lord. Lord, I pray this day and every day we would learn what it means to empty ourselves. That self-control is not about us. It's about you. If it's going to be a fruit of the Spirit, if we're going to reflect the character of Jesus. Lord, fill us with your spirit now that we more and more would become your witness because more and more we begin to look like you and bear your character in our lives by the power of the Holy Spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.